program from Imagine, Erie, Pennsylvania. Funding for this program was provided by Coalition for Freedom, Millikan and Company, and E.A. Morris. If you take a close look at the poverty figures, the most ironic and I think tragic conclusion that you reach is that we were winning the war on poverty in this country until shortly after Lyndon Johnson declared war on it. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Labor unions have used their power over the years to support policies and programs here in Washington uh, that have the effect of excluding blacks. Some 55% of all black children in America are now born out of wedlock. Nineteen sixty-three, a time of incredible optimism for black people. The civil rights movement was about to achieve its greatest triumphs. A great war on poverty had been declared. But something went wrong. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This might be that road. It's covered thick with good intentions. In the mid-1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, federal and state governments poured immense energy and well over a trillion dollars into the task of relieving poverty and promoting equality. The result, a complete failure. For many blacks at the lower end of the economic spectrum, the future looks more hopeless today than it did 20 years ago. More black teenagers and young adults are unemployed. More black families depend on welfare. Fewer black children are getting a decent education. In some inner cities, more than 70% of black babies are born out of wedlock. More black youngsters commit crimes. More black people are victims of crimes. My name is Dr. Walter Williams, and I'm an economist. I have spent much of my life studying the causes of poverty. I broke out of the North Philadelphia ghetto nearly 30 years ago, and so did most of my friends. But today, fewer young blacks are escaping places like this. I want to spend the next 30 minutes exploring the reasons why. For believe it or not, to a considerable extent, the government is the culprit. It is the government with its hundreds of billions of dollars. It is the government with its thousands of programs. It is the government with its endless good intentions. Freedom, 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 freedom. Government anti-poverty programs have often ended up locking people into poverty. To see how, let's begin where everybody begins, in school. This is the first place I ever did that, Benjamin Franklin High School in North Philly. Franklin was mostly black when I was a student here in 1954. It has always had its problems financially and academically. But I got a solid education here, and so did my classmates. Most of my classmates read at or above grade level. They came to school, they did their homework, and they behaved. But as in most schools all over America, Things at Franklin got worse in the 60s and 70s. Test scores plummeted. Many Franklin students do work far below high school level. More students get diplomas, but those diplomas are worth less. And discipline got so bad that at Franklin, as in most nearby schools, security guards patrol the hallways. In the early 1960s, the federal government was putting less than a billion dollars a year into elementary and secondary education. Since 1964, federal spending on elementary secondary schools has gone up more than 900 percent. And during that very period, education has gone downhill by every conceivable objective measurement of real academic performance. The 1960s were a time of great hope for public education. Not only was federal money coming in, most black people believed that integration and the civil rights movement would put black parents in greater control of their children's education. It didn't work out that way. 
20 years ago, more than half of every dollar spent on education went to classroom teachers. But today, the fastest growth area in education is administrators, researchers, consultants, people who often don't even set foot in a classroom, and we're now spending less than 40 cents out of every dollar on classroom teachers. There's a parasitic structure that has come into being that has nothing to do with the interaction between teacher and child in the classroom. Can we really blame government for the nationwide decline in education? Can we blame the Vietnam War, or the turmoil of the 60s, or lingering discrimination? Unfortunately not. While public schools are falling apart, non-public schools are maintaining their standards. Schools like this one, Ivy Leaf of Philadelphia, just a few miles from Benjamin Franklin. Ivy Leaf spends far less in educating their children, yet 80% of their children score higher than the national norm on standardized reading and math tests. When my daughter was in the public schools, my husband and I felt that she was not being challenged enough. So we took her out and put her in Ivy Leaf, and we're very happy, and she's very happy, because not only is she making good grades, she also has self-confidence, and she's showing some leadership qualities. Within the last two years, the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise has been working on uh, a study trying to identify where the independent schools, especially those schools that catered primarily to minority students. We found a great number that were stable, uh, successful in producing achieving students. Independent schools are doing a much better job than public schools on the average. Public schools are bad for black people today for the same reasons they were bad 30 years ago under segregation. Black parents did not control the public schools then, and black parents do not control the public schools today. Some people have been fighting to give parents that control. A few years ago here in Washington, D.C., proponents of the tuition tax credit bill worked hard to push forth this initiative, which would simply allow, in the city, poor parents to have freedom of choice for their kids to attend the school of their choice, whether it's a public or non-public school. They simply wanted to make sure that their kids got a quality education. Now this tuition tax credit scheme is nothing more than a device through which the individual parent would receive a tax credit uh, on their income tax by taking that money allowed by the public education system. Now it was soundly defeated here in Washington, D.C. simply because the education establishment vehemently opposed it because they did not want the inner city parents to have freedom of choice. Many of the politicians who got involved in this fight against tuition tax credits actually have their kids in non-public schools, in exclusive private schools, if you will. And it's an absolute tragedy. Tuition tax credits wouldn't provide a utopia, but they would give poor parents the power to choose a school like Ivy Leaf, rather than see their children condemned to a third-rate public school. As long as they have the best for their kids, they simply don't care about the others. So what happens to kids who leave third-rate public schools for the job market? They run into yet another government-imposed roadblock, the minimum wage. I used to work in a store like this. I didn't need a ladder back then either. I was 15 at the time, but I've been working since I was 10. As a shoeshine boy, dishwasher, fruit picker, and other odd jobs. But I wasn't the exception. My whole crowd worked. Back in those days, just about any kid who looked for a job could find one. Today, in ghettos like I grew up in, 70% of black children who look for jobs cannot find them. That's a shame, because a first job means much more than pocket change. It's a chance for a start, maybe in a store like this. Most of the kids that you give jobs to, uh, they, they hold them for a long period of time here, you know, and, and I wish I could give more kids jobs because I have kids constantly coming up to me asking me for jobs, you know, and I can't give them the jobs that I, that I wish I could give them. For a small employer to hire a young, inexperienced worker is a risk. The grocer who hired me could afford that risk. I only earn a dollar an hour, but that's all I was worth. I didn't have any experience or skills. Today, with an effective minimum wage of nearly $4 an hour, 
the risk of hiring a young, inexperienced worker may be too expensive to take. If there were a uh, lower minimum wage, I could hire maybe two or three more. The minimum wage law is a perfect example of the pattern afflicting poor black people today. The government, in an attempt to protect poor people, often creates new obstacles for them. In the 1950s, the minimum wage was only a dollar an hour. Given the price level at that time, that meant there was virtually no minimum. Starting in 1961, Congress began to push the minimum wage higher. In effect, the law forced teenagers to ask for more than they were worth. As it became more expensive to hire young workers, black teenage unemployment soared. By 1982, the effective minimum wage, including Social Security and other payroll taxes, was almost $4 an hour. And black teenage unemployment stood at nearly 50%. Other factors contributed, but the minimum wage did a lot of the damage. Going to be look out for three black males, ages 12 to 14 years. The minimum wage may seem like a small thing, but if government had prevented me from working as a teenager, as it prevents so many kids today, it might have altered the entire course of my life. If at that crucial time, I had gotten into the habits of the street, rather than the habits of working, I hate to think where I might be today. Of course, many black people have made it in recent years, especially those who have finished college and entered their professions. But many others, on the lower end of the scale, trying to get solid blue-collar careers have run into government roadblocks that work just like the minimum wage law. I drove a cab back in 1957 for a while. I made about $125 a week. The drivers in Philly now tell me they make about $250 a week. If they own their own cabs, they can make almost twice as much and be in business for themselves. But what stops them? It's the thousands of federal and state regulations that are imposed on the U.S. economy. In Philly, the number of cab licenses is restricted by law. That makes them scarce and expensive, almost $20,000 a piece at last count. If you can't come up with the 20 grand, forget about driving for yourself. In Washington, D.C., you can get a cab license for less than $50. As a result, 90% of the D.C. cabbies own their own cabs, compared to less than 50% in Philly. Fares are lower, the drivers keep more, and of course, more people can get work as drivers. If a cab driver on, had to pay $20,000 for a cab here, uh, the poor cab drivers couldn't grab a cab. There are 10,000 cabs in D.C. Over 70% are owned by blacks. In New York and Philadelphia, blacks own less than 20% of the cabs. Government licensing closes the door to economic opportunity. Nearly a thousand occupations in the United States exclude people who do not have licenses. Sometimes the licenses cost money. Sometimes they require the applicant to pass complicated tests that have little to do with the job. Sometimes getting a license requires a friend in the business. All those licensing laws do just one thing, keep outsiders out. Those outsiders are often members of minority groups. Uh, back during the 30s and 40s, uh, there were practices uh, that, that were rampant in the South, particularly uh, in uh, the, uh, the former slaveholding states, uh, where blacks were specifically excluded by predominantly white unions. Example, electricians unions, plumbers unions, railroad firemen unions, and at that time, uh, the, the records of history will demonstrate that uh, it was the purpose of white unions to exclude uh, blacks, uh, mi uh, minorities in general, from the workplace. Uh, in fact, there were statements specifically made in connection with uh, occupational licensing regulations that if this law is successful, it will have the effect of reducing to a minimum the involvement of blacks, or Negroes as they were called then, in the workplace. This is the Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. Back in 1880, when Washington was still a segregated city, this beautiful building was built by black artisans, black plumbers, carpenters, and masons. And mind you, all working under black supervision. So are many other important public buildings in this city and in cities throughout the South. Today, that sounds remarkable. 
Even now, black people have a hard time breaking into the skilled construction trades. The fact is, in the late 1800s, black people were better represented in many of the skilled trades than they are today. Today, such blatant racism is illegal, and many union leaders would like to see more black workers in union jobs. But again, good intentions don't always produce good results. The effect of the government endorsing uh, collective bargaining and the closed shop concept within the union movement was that it uh, basically locked in place to a large degree for a generation or two to come uh, white domination of unions. And when you confer upon a union in effect monopoly rights to bargain collectively for the entire workforce, uh, they in effect can lay out the conditions, they can set the price uh, for their labor, uh, and they can control entrance uh, to that particular industry. Restrictive labor laws are just like minimum wages in some ways. In effect, they force inexperienced workers to charge more for their labor and thus keep them from competing for jobs. There are many examples, but one of the most infamous is the Davis-Bacon Act. Passed in the racist days of 1931, but still in force today. The Davis-Bacon Act is a 50-year-old law passed during the Depression, the purpose of which was to prevent employers from undercutting wages at a time when it was very much a seller's market in employment, a very high unemployment rate, and it was a worker protection act. Now, it's very much outdated today because the Davis-Bacon Act, 50 years later, has become a union protection act. The net effect of the Davis-Bacon Act today is that it favors union construction firms. Most blacks are in non-union construction firms or are independent tradesmen. Davis-Bacon excludes them from most government contracts. Of course, the government also has programs to help black people get jobs. Between 1960 and 1980, the government spent almost $90 billion on job training and jobs programs. 30 million people went through those programs. The result? Unemployment among the targeted groups went up, not down. Good intentions just don't cut it. It is morally outrageous for government to be cutting off the ambitions of those trying to climb the middle rungs of the economic ladder. Whether as cab drivers, construction workers, masons, or manicurists. After all, hope is the most important thing that people can have. But what good is hope? when people try to break out of poverty just to find that the rules of the game are stacked against them. And where do people end up after the government denies them chances for a decent education or a decent job? In the clutches of the worst government roadblock of them all, the dependency of the welfare system. This is where we lived, the Richard Allen Project of North Philadelphia. My father deserted us when I was three, so occasionally my mother had to take welfare. But she didn't like it, so she took work as a domestic servant whenever she could. Back then, welfare wasn't a way of life. My mother only received $25 a week. Almost any job paid more than that. So even if she wanted to stay on welfare, she had very little incentive to do so. The changes in welfare benefits uh, during the 1960s were quite large. If you take the case of a woman going on AFDC in a, in a typical industrial state, I'll, I'll take Pennsylvania as an example, in 1960 she would have gotten about $23, which in 1980 purchasing power was about $63. By 1970 she could have gotten benefits conservatively estimated, not tapping all of the possible sources of support, but, but a, a minimal package that would amount to about $134 in 1980 purchasing power. By way of comparison, a minimum wage job in 1960 only paid $111 in 1980 purchasing power. In other words, in 1970, the AFDC plus other forms of benefits were providing purchasing power somewhat greater than you could make by working 40 hours a week at a minimum wage job only 10 years earlier. I came from a broken home. But in my day, that was unusual. Black families were almost as stable as white families. The black family did not start falling apart until the 1960s, as more blacks were lured into the welfare culture. And this came in two ways. One way was that 
prevented the formation of families, that is, fostered illegitimacy. And it's easy to understand how this happened. Just imagine that you're a 16-year-old girl in some ghetto apartment. Uh, you scarcely know your father. He occasionally visits. Perhaps he's drunk a lot of the time. He doesn't have a job. Uh, he, your mother is under terrible stress trying to discipline her boys who are often out, the, out in the streets in gangs. The neighborhood is rife with crime. Uh, within the household itself, there are serious tensions between you and your mother. Uh, it, it's just a very difficult and trying way of life. And the government, however, offers a deal to this 16-year-old girl. It says you can leave all this. You can have liberation in an apartment of your own. You can have access to some 17 different social programs. You can have free medical care, free legal assistance if you need it. You can have several hundred dollars a, a month free, all on one condition. And that one condition is that you have an illegitimate child. And this isn't a racial problem. It's not had nothing to do with blacks uh, as a race. Uh, indeed, in Sweden, where they have an even more ample welfare state, 40% of all Swedish children are born out of wedlock. In my day, no able-bodied adult male could receive welfare or even live in a household that received welfare. We were lucky. There was no way we could be sucked into the welfare trap. When you talk about young men getting into the working market uh, labor force during the 1960s, I think one of the saddest stories is that they were told not to, to do those things which were eventually going to bring them out of poverty permanently, which is to say that a young man, uh, before the advent of a lot of these changes, not only had to hang on to that, in quotes, dead-end job, by hanging on to it, he was also establishing a record as a reliable worker, and as time went on, he had more and more chances to establish a more secure job and get a better income. Once it became more rational for him to drift in and out of the labor market, having a job for a while, then not having a job and putting together a package of welfare benefits, perhaps getting some money from a woman he was living with, perhaps getting some money in the underground economy, that would increase his income in the short term. But when he got to be 23, 24 years old, he had already labeled himself in his own eyes and in the eyes of the labor market as an unreliable worker who is qualified only for the worst possible jobs. In other words, the welfare state tells you that you're optional, that all your struggles, all your labors in the workforce are unnecessary that, as a matter of fact, that you can support your wife and children best by leaving them. That's the deal that uh, the welfare state offers uh, the, the man in the ghetto. And not surprisingly, over the years, increasing numbers of men have left their families in the ghetto. Back in my day, to be called a welfare kid was almost as bad as being called a nigger. But because of so-called welfare reforms, many of the kids who live here know nothing else. They may never learn to pull themselves out of poverty one step at a time. Like some giant drug pusher, their government has lured them into dependency on a system that will maintain them in permanent poverty. In every respect, welfare reform has backfired. 20 years after we declared war on poverty, poverty has won. Restrictive labor laws, minimum wages, public schools, jobs programs, and a maze of welfare programs have all been prescribed as weapons in the war against poverty. But poverty is winning. These people are poor, but they don't have to stay poor for their intelligent, honest and potentially hard-working persons. Can they make it on their own? Given the right kind of help, of course they can. The solution is quite simple. Give parents greater control over their children's education by setting up a tuition tax credit or voucher system. 
which will broaden parental choice by introducing competition and in turn revitalize our public and non-public schools. Remove the burden of the minimum wage from youngsters. Teenagers need early work experiences to learn the world of work and yes, make mistakes while they're young. That way, they become more valuable as adult workers. Eliminate government roadblocks that prevent fledgling entrepreneurs from starting their own business. Enact a compassionate welfare system, such as a negative income tax that removes demeaning dependency and disincentives. America's long tradition of converting poor people into middle class people can be extended to today's poor by giving them the right to make their own decisions. As Martin Luther King said, let freedom ring. Let it ring in the schools, the job markets, and the neighborhoods across the land. And then we can all be free, free at last. Freedom, freedom. Sat right there, dog, help uh, scratching on the door to be let in. Open the door for Sad, she said. And then and the bright sunlight streamed in and seemed to show them both. They left the door open and sat on the doorstep. There was there was a familiar view, the meadow. The early sun coming over the trees, the glint of the palm, the day began. Paul Wood. Good Intentions was produced by Imagine Incorporated, which is solely responsible for its content. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Good Intentions, Imagine Incorporated, P.O. Box 379, McCain, Pennsylvania, 16426. That's Good Intentions, Imagine Incorporated, P.O. Box 379, McCain, Pennsylvania, 16426. Funding for this program was provided by Coalition for Freedom, Millican & Company, and E.A. Morris. <laughs>